Good afternoon. If you could grab your seats. I would like to invite our newest board member and a living legend and legacy at Marillac St. Vincent Family Services, Sister Katie Norris, to come up and say a prayer for our time together. Sister Katie. Well, welcome everybody. It's a pleasure to be here with you and to be here to celebrate the wonders of um, Marillac St. Vincent's. So um, I don't want to keep you from your food, so let's just begin, all right? We remember we're always in, God, in God's presence, and so today we're, able, we're united as all of us are beacons of hope for those around us. So today we gather to combine our gifts as well as our treasures to be a source of hope for those who come to us, the old, the young, the fearful, the hopeful, the appreciative, and the wary. They need to be seen and heard, and today we will see and hear their voices and their stories. Bless the staff at Marillac St. Vincent's who see their potential every day and bring hope to their future. Guide and direct us, Lord, as we strive to be a sign of hope, love, and acceptance for others. Bless our food, our conversation. Bless those who prepared our food, those who are serving us, and the many people who today are looking for a place of friendship and nourishment and fellowship that they may be as graced and gifted as we are this day. And so we say, amen. But I have the distinct pleasure of opening today's event with the creativity part. So I know for those of us who have never experienced spoken word or those who have, either way, I can guarantee that you are in for a treat. If you've never experienced spoken word before, please do not be alarmed. These are just words that are rhyming and I'm being passionate about me being a father. And that's why I was brought here today to bring my passion and my purpose to this space. So if you could just give me a few seconds of your time while you enjoy your meal, that would be great. So I open this with a question. What's more dangerous, someone who's not afraid to die or one who's found everything to live for? And I asked him if he was proud of me as he laid his pecan colored head on my chest and he replied yes. And I went through my mind a thousand times to figure out what that could possibly mean and every single option ended in motivation for me. So you may not be afraid to die, but I have found something to live for. That means I'm more afraid to let them down. As we sat down and traced out African kings adorned with crowns, absent of sound, I watched that pencil press and regressed, impressed all at the same time. And it reminded me of my own approach, live and let learn, teach and be taught, take it all in. I may not remember it all and I probably should have wrote it down, but they probably taught me more than I could ever give them credit for. But one thing's for sure, I see their face when I walk through those doors. When I put my two feet down on pavement, every time I write these words down on pages, see, those two little boys are my gift to society, my rites of passage. You think I'll let the world take that from me? Why they sitting at home waiting on me? They used to ask to hear my music. I remained calm, but inside I was losing it. They're not too cool for me. And I returned that sentiment. I'll never be too cool for them. But they peace standing tall because they saw me do it. So that's an effect that has been noted. But please let it be noted that I told my job they could dock my pay because it was just way more important to take them to school every day. I told my job they could dock my pay because it was just way more important to take them to school every day just so they could walk through those doors with their chest poked out as they've allowed me to. I walk standing tall because of you. 
And a lot of what I'm teaching you, your grandparents taught me. And I realized that those streets can't have you. I become way too selfish. I release myself from so many situations. I've become so selfless. See, I was a man with a plan. You could hear it in my voice, but being a father is an honor, a duty, a choice, and I choose you every single time. And if you fail, it's all on me. Nobody else, not even your wonderful mother, as amazing as she is, and that she is, but if you fail, that's all on me. That's a weight I chose to absorb. I remember I was down in Texas performing. And this was back, my, my oldest is like, he's gonna be 15 this weekend, but this was back when he was like two or something. And I was down in Texas and I was performing. It was the first time I talked to him on the phone and was away from him. And I told him, I'm trying my best just to make you proud. He probably had no clue what I was saying to him, but he ended that conversation with, I love you. And I cried. I lived. So even if you're not afraid to die, I found something to live for. And that's a dangerous motive forever fueled. So your thoughts may be involuntary, but these actions are very calculated. See, I was a dad with a plan, but now I'm a dad with a decree. And you can't take that from me. My son's not raised by no coward. That means they won't be one either. So if this be the measure stick of a man, you're going to need way more meters because I take it too far so they never come up short, and that's an extended metaphor. I say my sons ain't raised by no coward, and they won't be one either. And if this be the measure of a man, the yardstick going to need way more meters. I'll take it too far so they never come up short, and that's an extended metaphor. So I'll end it with a question. What's more dangerous? Someone who's not afraid to die or one who's found everything to live for. Thank you, Harold, for that. Um, I think that says it all about how we feel and the work we do and looking at things from a different perspective, but understanding if everything that he just said is who you are. And I think I look at that, that impacts me and who I look at, my 14-year-old son and what I want him to be how he chooses to be in this world as he steps out into it. But if he fails, that is, that's on me. If our youth that we take care of and serve each day, if they fail, that's on us. So we have to do more to make sure that we provide the resources and the activities and the love that they need in order to survive. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Albert Richardson. I'm the Senior Director of Youth Services Programs at Merrill Lake St. Vincent Family Services. Uh, I am proud to be here to you know, take in all and share all the work that we do with our youth and our families. Um, but more importantly, it's more exciting for me because it was an impact for me as a youth years ago. And now being part of leadership and working in the classrooms, it's important now for us to, to welcome our new leadership that'll become, you'll be hearing from them later as we take that, that road down to making sure that we continue to uplift our communities and our youth. So right now, I want to tell you a little bit about one of the, the new leaders that will be stepping up here in a few minutes. Michael joins Merrill Lake St. Vincent Family Services with a goal of growing MSV impact through private donors, organizational brand awareness, innovation, and the services for the community. As the organization continues to carry out its mission to break the cycle of poverty through programs serving youth, families, and seniors. He brings deep experience in leading high-performing, multidisciplinary teams who are passionate about serving their communities. Now, prior to his work with Opportunity International, International a global nonprofit offering services for more than 30 countries, Michael served 16 years in leadership roles at World Vision USA, where he led a global team in partnering with churches, church networks, and ministry partners. During that time, he founded Team World Vision, one of the fastest growing endurance charity programs in the United States and top generator of new donors, with more than 50,000 volunteers and over 100 million in donations raised. In addition to his experience developing and implementing new fundraising programs, Michael is an established public speaker. And we, we've heard it firsthand, and you're gonna hear it in a few minutes published author and a civic leader. 
A committed and enthusiastic advocate for justice, he serves on the board of Collective Chicago, a nonprofit organization dedicated to community development and the creation of space for young men with a history of homelessness to help change the trajectory of their life. I also know him to be a mentor. Just the other day, I pleasured him talking to a mentee that he still walks that road with, never leaving him alone. Michael holds a Master of Social Work degree from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and a Bachelor of Science from Olivet Nazarene University. On a lighter and fun side, he lives in Oak Park, Illinois with his wonderful family, his wife, Danny, and his son, Cruz, who I had the pleasure of meeting this past weekend. We're gonna join that band, you and your son, soon. He enjoys endurance running, rock climbing, and playing the guitar with his son in a two-piece band. And by the way, I want to mention that he did run in this year's Chicago Marathon, so we're proud of him for doing that as well. I think overall, Michael simply wants to do what all of us wants to do, and that is serve. Serve with love, serve with compassion, and serve with a purpose. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me to welcome the new CEO of Merrillac St. Vincent Family Services, Mr. Michael Chitwood. The first time I ever really even witnessed poverty uh, was in the eyes of a 10-year-old girl named Triana. I was 21 years old. I was in my first year teaching fifth grade in a school where most of my students lived at or below the poverty line. Triana was in my class, and she fell asleep every single day on her desk, and she rarely got any homework done. I could tell by the little work she did that she was one of the smartest kids in the class, but she was failing every subject. One day after school, I decided to do a home visit. So I stopped by the office to see the school secretary and got the address for where Triana lived. And the school secretary wrote it on a post-it note, got my car, and headed to that address. When I got there, it did not look like a house or an apartment building. I was kind of confused. I didn't know if I was in the right place. I walked through the front door and found a woman at the front desk, told her who I was there to see. She walked me down a dimly lit hallway, took me to a door and said, this is her room, and walked away from me. I knocked, and when Triana's mom answered the door, it all became clear to me. This wasn't an apartment building. This was a homeless shelter. Triana was living in one room with her mom and her five siblings. It became pretty clear why she wasn't getting any work done and why she was sleeping all day in class. Triana and the 20 other kids in my class that year changed my life forever. You see, I had grown up with every opportunity and advantage available to me, and I grew up thinking that everyone was born with the same opportunities. And it became crystal clear to me that year that it's just not true. Not everyone was born with the same set of opportunities, and the playing field is definitely not level. I spent the past 20 years of my life working in local and global humanitarian work, trying to understand the root causes of systemic poverty. Something that has become very clear to me is that poverty is complex, but at its core, poverty is a result of broken systems and broken relationships. So what does it take for kids like Triana and her family to overcome generational poverty? Well, I can tell you this, it's not work ethic. In my experience, some of the people experiencing the deepest poverty in the world are the hardest working people you would ever meet. The truth is, there are no simple solutions. But at Merrillac St. Vincent Family Services, we're dedicated to figuring it out. And our vision is to end the generational cycle of poverty through an equitable world where every child, every family, every person can thrive. We do this in the Vincentian spirit of service, which means that we believe you can meet Jesus in the lives of those who've been marginalized. We recognize the sacred in one another. We live out our mission through an incredible team of staff and volunteers that provide high-quality programs and services to children, youth, and families experiencing poverty. Programs like Project Hope, our doula and home visiting program that serves young and parenting and expecting mothers and fathers as young as 13 years old, helping equip them for parenthood, helping connect them to health care to ensure that they have healthy births, foster educational development for their children, and set them up for a positive parenting experience for their family. 
or through our early childhood education program, which provides educational environments to hundreds of children, birth to five, getting them ready for school. Through our youth programs, like Hope Junior and our school age program, where we provide positive mentoring to youth and teens that allow them to develop into thriving adults. Our senior services that provide support, activities, and resources to 200 of our seniors in the community to help ensure that they can thrive as they age. And our community outreach work, which provides holistic support through generational economic mobility and sustainability, community education, and job readiness. In just a bit, we're going to invite you to partner with us in this work and help us in realizing our vision of improving, scaling, and expanding our impact. And as you listen to some of that vision, I want to invite you to open your heart to, and consider how God might have you partner with us at Marillac St. Vincent Family Services. I'm excited for you to hear a bit more about our vision and impact by introducing you to someone special to me, our Chief Program Officer, Danielle Jeffrey. Danielle has been serving in that role for just over a year, but she brings nearly two decades of experience and commitment to effective program design and implementation. Danielle is helping us lead our strategic plan to improve, create, and scale best-in-class programs. Programs that are informed by the community's greatest needs and are evaluated using uh, evidence-based impact metrics so that we can ensure we're having the greatest impact possible. I've had the chance to get to know Danielle over the past six months since becoming CEO. And I, am, I believe that this is a season where we need her talent in this organization to help take us into the future. And I'm just so excited about what she brings, her commitment, her experience, and I'm excited for you to get to know her a little bit this morning. Would you please help me welcome our Chief Program Officer, Danielle Jeffrey. So I'm a podium chick, so I want to speak from the podium this morning, this afternoon. How's everyone doing? Doing well? Everybody looks nice? Eating well? Michael, thank you for that warm introduction. I truly appreciate and looking forward to working alongside with you and the rest of our colleagues. A year ago, I began my journey at Marillac St. Vincent Family, Children, Family Services as Chief Program Officer. During this time, I've had the opportunity to observe and evaluate programs by engaging with staff members, program participants, board and committee members, and other community-based organizations. A moment to reimagine programs to our shared ideals. One where all children, youth, families can thrive. And momentarily, you will hear firsthand from current and past participants share their experience at Marillac St. Vincent. Over the past year, we have accomplished great things, including reimagining our programs to, to transform service delivery that combat systemic inequality, build stability, and prevent challenges from becoming life-altering crises. Restructuring program design to improve program efficiency, outcomes, and impact. Secure additional funding to scale services in early childhood education, community outreach, and support services. And lastly, building our workforce development pipeline. As we evolve over the next five years, we aspire from providing crisis response services to holistic child and family-centric solutions. Creating best-in-class programs prenatal to seniors with concentrated services demonstrating robust impact and advanced practice through advocacy and innovation. We will differentiate our key areas of work through the following. Best people, employ a high performing workforce that delivers measurable mission impact. Best results, continuously improve program results through data informed practices. And lastly, best reputation, build brand visibility in a best, be, build brand visibility as a best in class provider. More importantly, reimagine holistic supports for every child and every family with increased access to services around social determinants of health, such as healthcare, education, food security, economic mobility, housing, mental wellness, trauma, and environment. Moreover, improve, the element, improve and elevate programming by partnering with families. You see, when families, they understand what they need. 
and most important, a role as to be an effective thought partner. Our role is to listen and respond as coaches, allies, mentors, and advocates, rather than as healers, judges, saviors, and fixers. Furthermore, investing in staff and their well-being. This means a livable wage, ongoing professional learning and development, supporting working conditions in a work environment where their voices are welcome as critical partners in our work to improve programs. Because when we invest in our staff, we are investing in our children and in our families. This is our moment, is our moment not only to have best in class programs, but also addressing inequities that have existed in our communities for far too long, unapologetically address opportunity and achievement gaps, make access and opportunity the great equalizer. All children and families should thrive and opportunity should not be predicted by race, background, zip code, and circumstance. In closing, we will continue to work towards programs and services being the central hub in the community where all children and families have access to services and resources they need to thrive. Thank you. So at this time, we do have a panel discussion for you. And I would like to bring forward our panelists, uh, participants. First off, I just want to say thank you to these powerful, lovely women for participating in today's panel discussion. <laughs> Definitely a representation of what excellence looks like here on this stage. I just wanna take a couple of minutes, about 10 to 15 minutes to really um, have a conversation about the work, your experience, your lived journeys, um, and how it impacts your work today. Um, so I'd like this time to really go around and have you introduce yourself, um, and I will start to my left. Well, good afternoon. Uh, thank you for giving me this opportunity to speak on this panel at this auspicious occasion, Beacon of Hope. I am Nina Houston. Where are you from? I am from Chicago, born and raised on the west side of Chicago, East Garfield Park. And how did you come to know about Marillac St. Vincent? Sure, well we lived, uh, lived at our family home, which was just steps away from Marillac uh, until uh, middle school aged. My grandmother, Mrs. Fannie Mae Houston, was a retired uh, business owner and she volunteered at Marillac in the food pantry as well as the thrift store. Well, my mom, who became a teen mom um, at an early age, my grandmother encouraged her to enroll uh, us, and when I say us, you're going to hear us, we, that's because I'm a twin. Uh, but uh, she enrolled us at Marillac uh, at the age of two years old. We were part of Tiny Tots program. Long time. Yeah. Long time. Hi, so I'm Tina, mm -hmm. Tina Geider, and I am also from Chicago. Um, currently, I reside in the Naperville, Plainfield area. But to much of what Nina has said, um, we are so proud of our heritage and all that Merrill Lake has done for us. And you'll hear, hear a little bit more um, throughout this conversation, um, but we are richly blessed. Our lives have been richly blessed through the impact that Merrill Lake House has um, had. Uh, and the impact that it has had on us. So that's my beginning. Hi. Oh, yes, we can. I, my brothers, my three brothers and I spent our ECE, early childhood education years at St. Vincent in the old, in the first built, in the old building that they knocked down before the current building that stands now. I am also currently a parent of a toddler in the Head Start program and it's interesting because I was speaking with my mother yesterday and she said that there wasn't a parent policy or just general parent program at St. Vincent. She was just getting to know the staff and other parents and they were just bonding and 
That's why she was there all the time. She's currently in the LSC at my elementary school. And so because of all that growing up from first to eighth grade, I decided that I needed to do something for my daughter and I joined the parent policy team where I am the current chair. Thank you. Last but not least. My name is Juanita Sawyer. I came to Chicago from Evanville, Mississippi, and I got involved through the pantry. From the pantry, I met two nice friends. And from there, they kept asking me, come on, go to Take Charge. You should join. So I joined Church Star, Take Charge. And this is where my journey started. I went on, went to the computer class, learned how to do the computer, learned how to send emails, and learned how to do this. Taking the test with Holly came out with 93. I couldn't believe it. And just believe me, yesterday I had a birthday. I turned 83 years old. Wow. I turned 83 years old. Mm -mm. And that's how I started at Take Charge. And from Take Charge, I went on to the computer room. Then I had some kids. I didn't know which way to go. I had got a little down and out. So then, dealing with Take Charge, I went to Holly, Sister Kate. They helped me. Went on over to Take Charge, got the kids in school. While they was at, they was getting like Fs and F plus. And from, when I got them in Take Charge and Hope Junior, they started getting A's and B's. I said, ooh, look at the progress they are making. Then from Take Charge, we started having trip trips. Trips, went on a boat cruise, went to Navy Pier, had that. I was like, oh, look at me at my age. I was just <laughs> exalted and I was blessed, you know. So I said, this is for me. So I want to thank the entire star staff, Sin Mills, and Sin Vincent for accepting me. And I'm just a blessing and I'm happy to be here. And I want to thank each and every one for accepting me. First question I'm going to direct um, to you, Nina. How has Marillac St. Vincent informed your perspective in life, and what specific, specific tenets have you leaned into at key intervals in your professional life? Sure, um, I would like to just step back a bit uh, to my childhood where I received the most influence at Marillac House. Uh, just living uh, steps away at my grandmother's house, and if you could just uh, imagine with me for a moment. Growing up in a big house with my mom's uh, si siblings, sisters, brothers, cousins, families, friends, neighbors, and overhearing them talking about what was going on in the community. And during that time, um, there was a lot of unrest in the community due to coming off of the civil rights movement and then moving on to the Black Panther movement. But there was this house called Merrillac House. And that house was a place that we could go to to get all of our needs met. They had the resources that we needed. And I can recall listening to families and, and uh, some of our relatives uh, saying that, you know, well, I needed clothing or, you know, we needed food. And we went to Marillac and they really helped us. So that impacted me in a great way. And I always said as a child, I will never forget where I come from. I will never forget this place. I will never forget what it means to lend a helping hand. And it also uh, gave me a push inside to further my education. And I wanted to be purposeful, purpose-driven in my pursuits 
uh, of education, which is for higher learning, to go to higher learning, um, masters. Um, I'm also uh, currently uh, my own business owner. I'm a real estate broker. But things that I thought that would be impactful to help uh, the community as I would come back to the community to help. Um, in one of my roles as an IT project consultant, I've worked with uh, major, uh, on major, I would say, infrastructure projects with the city of Chicago, as well as Cook County Bureau of Technology, and then later work, workplace development and community outreach in, commun in college and universities uh, settings. That encouraged me greatly to give what was given to me from Merillac House. And to this day, I can say that um, I am richly blessed, as my sister would say, I'm richly blessed to be able to come back to the community and give back in an effective way. Thank you. <laughs> So much of our story is um, pretty close to being identical, right? So I'm going to go another path. And I'm going to talk about how um, my lessons learned and the values that I learned uh, coming through Merrill Lake House, coming through the west side of Chicago, being educated at Calhoun North, um, K through six, how it really um, instilled um, certain gifts um, within us, and I would say Going into high school, we were well equipped. We were in gifted classes um, at Calhoun North. Um, we participated in several events um, around the neighborhood, and our lives have just been touched by some incredible people. Um, you may have noticed that uh, we definitely uh, want to be touched by the sisters. So when, whenever we're in um, their presence, um, we definitely want to receive a blessing by being around them because, as she mentioned, um, starting Merrill Lake House um, at preschool age, right, um, we received so much. With that being said, as our family then relocated and moved, I would say, uh, to the western suburbs and we uh, began to go to other schools outside of CPS, Chicago Public Schools, we were well equipped to compete academically um, because of a lot of the uh, learnings that we received um, at our elementary school and even at uh, Merrill Lake House. I would say that we stood out and had a distinction, not just because we were identical twins, but perhaps the way that uh, we learned and perhaps the way that we were able to um, have the confidence that I feel was instilled in us uh, from Merrill Lake House. And when I talk about confidence, I will tell you, at the age of three years old, there was an incredible woman at Merrill Lake House whose name also was Mrs. Houston. She was not our relative, but she took us under her wings and she put my sister and I on the platform to sing at three years old. And I will tell you how that translated into us then becoming Grammy Award winners um, in a Chicago choir that has traveled all across the world. So having confidence, not just academically to be able to speak, but even in corporate America, there are many companies downtown here that I've worked at, and I have found myself serendipitously um, crossing over from my profession, which is procurement contract um, negotiation, contract management, into the HR corporate space. What's important about that? I will tell you, because I believe that diversity is a fact and an inclusion is a choice. So I have chosen that to be able to talk on many levels in corporate America to encourage organizations to include a more diverse workforce. With that being said, I've been able to participate in recruiting events at colleges and universities. 
And at my last company, I actually encouraged them to expand their talent pool by let's looking at let's look at excuse me HBCUs. Uh, the importance of that is because at HBCUs we're able to identify talent that is normally not included in that workspace. So we were able to actually accomplish that and um, just a number of things. So in the interest of time, I'll move along, but if I'm given the opportunity, I'll bring you up to speed on part two. <laughs> Thank you, Tina. <laughs> Ms. Brittany, I know I have the privilege to interact and engage with you over the last um, year and definitely want to um, make awareness of your advocacy work um, in early childhood education and most recently being an ambassador for the Illinois Head Start Association, um, leading at the uh, state uh, level um, engaging with stakeholders as well. So we commend you for your leadership in that space. But from your vantage, from your viewpoint, how have you seen early childhood education evolve over time? So, uh, I went to school and I have uh, associates in early childhood education. So, it was interesting when I had a daughter, I just immediately knew I wanted Lauren to go to St. Vincent because obviously that's where I went and I just know about the programming. And I think it was in the policy committee that I realized like, I like speaking up and fighting because that's kind of what I do in my free time. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm also a disability advocate. So I thought that was just the perfect marriage for me of child and advocacy. So I think that it has gotten more, there's more partnership with parents than I think previously because my, to, my, to the point of what my mom was telling me, there was nothing for her to say, let's fight for the kids and let's, okay, so rewind. I was graduating out of ECE at St. Vincent when Head Start was started. So we didn't get to see the full effect of what's going on now, which is, and she spoke to the point of like, the next generation picks up the ball and keeps running. And I hope that I'm showing Lauren that when she comes of age, she needs to get to work and do what she needs to do for her family. So I think it's interesting to see the progression even from when I was a child to now and like how we got here and where we're going. Thank you, Brittany. <laughs> Ms. Swanee, we love to hear you talk, of course, as well. What I definitely want to know is what have you really enjoyed the most? What aspects of the program um, you enjoyed the most at Merrillac St. Vincent? What I've enjoyed most about St. Merrillac and St. Vincent, first of all, is by getting involved and being there. Mm -hmm. That did something for me, okay? Then I joined Take Charge, got the kids in school. They went from A, from B's, got them in the Hope Learn. I got one just graduated. I got one still there, and he is excited. He on the basketball team. Okay, that was Holly, Hillary, the entire staff. They kept me going. I would get up in the morning, couldn't wait till Thursday to come again. Well, I got to go to take charge every Thursday. Couldn't wait till Thursday to come again where I could go to take charge. I don't talk much, but I just want to say, I'm blessed to be a part of the senior at St. Vincent and St. Mel, Mellock House. And I want to thank God for that. And I want to thank you and the entire staff of Mellock and St. Vincent for accepting me. Amen. Before we wrap up, I, I definitely um, have a question for each of you. Same question, I would love to hear your thoughts. Um, is what are your hopes and not only your hopes, but your aspiration for Merrillac St. Vincent in the future. I just want to keep on doing what I'm doing, mm -hmm. help, and keep on coming to, I, do, I like, love the pantry. Mm -hmm. The pantry is good. I got Holly there. That's why I went, I didn't know nothing about the computers, okay? 
<laughs> went to the computer class, learned how to send emails, and it was just gracious, okay? Then went over to take charge. It was gracious. Got on the boat. First of all, I was scared of the water, okay? <laughs> but I didn't tell nobody. I didn't tell Hillary. I didn't tell. Hillary kept asking me, are you okay, Miss Sawyer? Yeah, I'm okay. But in, deep inside, I wasn't okay. I said, never had, <laughs> never had been on the boat, the big boat sailing through the water. And I'm like, I can't swim. If this boat do anything, then I'm gone. But then when I got back to Navy Pier, it was the best experience I had had. Yeah. Thank you, Brittany. I think right now, we are in a moment of like transition. Mm -hmm. I think even as my daughter started at St. Vincent, she had to wait through the COVID pause. And after that, we kind of flourished with the parent policy. And I think we're at a slow, steady pace. And I hope that the ball keeps getting rolled more parent involvement and parents. So it's hard being a parent because I'm an entrepreneur, so my schedule is different. And that's kind of why I do more at the center. But I can't imagine having a full-time job and a child. And then you're, I'm bugging you to do <laughs> the policy work with me. So I just hope that parents become more involved so that children understand the value of parent involvement in their child's life as generations keep continuing to happen. Thank you, Brittany. It's Tina. <laughs> Nina or Tina? Yeah, I think okay. I'll, I'll step forward because okay. Tina might be a little lengthy. <laughs> Okay. Yeah, we we'll have like a couple of minutes so we but, can't be but, too lengthy. Right, now. but okay. I, I would like to say, you know, I, I thought long and hard about this and so I wrote a little something and it my greatest hope is for more community resiliency building a resilient community that focuses on the needs of the residents by working collaboratively and actively with the residents to have a more focused lens on issues and needs that impact the community how might we do that? I don't know, possibly, you know, town hall forums, things of that nature. Uh, but I am hopeful that Miralac will seek to be more competitive by supporting high quality education systems that address workforce development needs through innovative programming to build a more economically stable community. If Merrillac can maintain a focus on the foundational community issues, I believe it will ensure resiliency into the future by which families and youth can thrive, thereby supporting the mission moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Last but not least, Ms. Tina. So I would... Um, like to see us reevaluate what our value proposition is. What do we offer to the community? What do we offer to Chicago, the West Side, and the North Side? I would say that we have everything that we need, the resources to offer a better life to families within the community. I would like to see Miralite build a pipeline that ensures some success, more success, in 2023 and forward. The kind of pipeline that I envision is a pipeline for families who have youth, who are aspiring for higher education. How do we do that? We monitor, we track, we use our programs to follow them from elementary school to high school. 
then to find out if they are interested in furthering their education in college or trade schools. We make it possible, even if there are scholarships, whatever we can do to make it possible that we turn out some winners in our community. That's one way of having the pipeline. The other way is I will say that Merrill Lake House is over 100 years old. We are strong. And as Nina mentioned, we are resilient. Having that kind of strength says that we have a renewed faith. We talk about reimagining, but we have to have renewed faith to know that our sponsors, that our staff, that our new organization as it is being led by Mr. Chitwood, that we can do it and we can do it well. So I would enjoy all of you to please provide your support and your prayers and help us as we move forward. I know that we're going to do it, but let's make sure that we have a well-defined value proposition that is known not just within the walls of Merrill Lake House, but in the community, and we will become that beacon of hope. Thank you, thank you. That does conclude our panel discussion, and I want to thank each and every one of you. Thank you for your thoughts, for your vision, and I look forward to working with each and every one of you moving forward. Um, next up, I will like to turn it over to Michael um, to really talk about our ask. That's his job <laughs> at Maryland St. Vincent Family Services. So we're going to exit the stage and um, let Michael have the floor. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much to our special guests and to Danielle. I hope that gave you just a glimpse, a small glimpse into the window of the work and ministry of Maryland St. Vincent Family Services. If you had the chance to stop by one of our community centers, either in Lincoln Park or in East Garfield Park, on any given day, you might walk into an early childhood education classroom and find a teacher sitting on the floor doing some active play learning with some kids, giving, getting them ready to meet their learning readiness uh, goals to get ready for kindergarten. You might come across Miss Deanna and some of our teenagers working in our community garden, building relationships with mentors, and learning to uh, take care of the earth while they take care of each other. You might uh, find yourself with Ms. Keontae, uh, one of the staff members in our senior program. I had the chance to ride along with her a couple weeks ago, doing home deliveries of groceries to seniors who can't get out to shop. On any given day, we've got close to 200 staff working in the community, coming alongside families, trying to end the generational cycle of poverty. As you heard from our uh, guest panel, uh, this is a relational ministry embedded in the communities we serve, and it's a strategic ministry. We're developing a strategic plan to increase our scale and impact in the community. Something that I hear over and over from staff is the need is so big, we just need to do more. And so I'm going to invite you today to consider partnering with us. If you are a long-standing partner of Marillac St. Vincent Family Services, I want to say thank you for your support. I hope you'll continue on the journey with us. If you're new, I want to say welcome to the family. And as I invite you to consider what you might give today to support our ministry, I'd like to ask you to consider this. If you are a longtime partner, we need you now more than ever. I'd like you to prayerfully consider making your most generous gift ever to Marillac St. Vincent Family Services today. If you're new, I'd like you to consider making a gift that pushes the comfort level of your generosity just a little bit so that we can grow our impact in communities in Chicago. We want to make it really simple for you to give today. So on your programs, there's a QR code that you can scan with your phone. It'll take you straight to a secure donation page, and you can make your donation there. Or inside your program, if you're not comfortable giving online, there's an envelope, and you can give by credit card or by check. What I'd like to do, rather than giving a paddle raise today and asking you to make a public commitment, I want to give you just a minute or two to quietly reflect 
on how you might support our ministry today. And then in just a couple minutes, I'm going to come back up with Danielle for one more special moment before we close today. So let me give you just a couple of minutes to reflect on how you might be called to support our ministry today. And I'd like to just take a minute to tell you about a special award that we give out every year at the Beacon of Hope Luncheon. This is our 16th year hosting the Beacon of Hope Luncheon. And every year at this event, we recognize one or more people who've served as a beacon of hope in the community. Past recipients have often been donors or corporations who've given generously to the organization, or individuals, volunteers, or organizations who've had a significant impact in our community. The Beacon of Hope Award is the embodiment of our mantra, every child, every family, every person thriving. We're proud to honor individuals each year whose impact is marked both by deed and service to others. This recognition is awarded to those who through their lives have embraced the core values that are a hallmark of Marillac St. Vincent Family Services. Advocacy, integrity, creativity, respect, empowerment, and excellence. Through the Beacon of Hope Award, we proudly celebrate the power of the Vincentian spirit of service that honors the sacred in each person. And this year, we chose to recognize four special people who have an incredible impact on the work of Marillac St. Vincent Family Services. And they have no clue that they were getting this award. I would like to bring back to the stage Ms. Juanita, Nina, <laughs> Tina, and Brittany. And I don't want to take up too, too much time, but I do just want to say a couple of words. Um, of appreciation. One of my favorite advocates, advocates um, is James Baldwin. And one of my favorite quotes from James Baldwin is, not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it's faced. Each and every one of you have been a true inspiration in helping us change how we do our work, how we think about doing our work, where are we going into the future. And I just want to say, and the rest of Mary Lex St. Vincent family, is say thank you for your work, for your compassion, for your work ethic, for your grit, and everything that you have done over the last years growing up with some of you guys with Mary Lex St. Vincent, serving on the board of trustees at Mary Lex St. Vincent, helping us move the pantry along to make sure that we are trying to end the food desert crisis in our community. So thank you. Ladies, can you uh, stay on stage just uh, one more minute? Uh, we have one other special little thing. We heard, Miss Juanita, yesterday was your 83rd birthday. Yes. And 83, so 83. Uh, we thought it'd yes. be a nice occasion. We got a room full of guests. Could we sing happy birthday to Miss Juanita? All right. Uh, uh, Miss Tina or Miss Nina, you just told us you're Grammy winning singers. Maybe you could help start us yes. off here. <laughs> Testing, one, two, three, testing. Testing, testing. Testing. This one's working. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, Juanita. Happy birthday to you. I just want to say thank each and every one of you. I am so happy. You don't know how I feel inside. It's a blessing to have people to come and know that I got loved ones, that people care about me. It's just me. I'm just, I don't have no sisters or no nothing. I just got Melock and St. Vincent. And I just want to say thank you for accepting me and God bless and keep each and every one of you. Well, as we uh, wrap up today, I just had a few more quick recognitions and thank yous I wanted to shout out. First to our Beacon of Hope host committee. 
uh, that helps put this together year after year. I want to say thank you to our brand new special event manager and marketing manager, Dottie Blanchard, who started just two and a half months ago. And uh, we told her she had a big event to help pull off. To our board members who are with us today, our board chair, Suzanne Chappie, and a special thank you to Sister Katie for joining us, and again, our newest member of our board. Um, friends, thank you for spending some time with us today. I know it's a busy day to take some lunch time and uh, get, get to the heart of downtown Chicago, but I hope you were inspired a little bit. I also hope that if you're new or if you're a longtime partner and you're interested in learning more about this vision and strategy we're putting together, if you're interested in visiting, visiting with us in one of our locations, I invite you to come. Set up time with myself or one of our staff members. We'd love to grab a cup of coffee with you or to host you at one of our locations and just give you a tour and help you learn a little bit more about the impact uh, and legacy of Marillac St. Vincent Family Services. Thank you for your time today. If you still have an envelope and you need someone to turn it into, there'll be staff on the way out. And, uh, and there's several standing up. Thank you so much. Have a blessed day and a blessed weekend. <laughs>